see is dominating headlines. Overall, there is a staunch opposition to the central government's move to consider UCC as Law Commission has also invited opinions on it. I'm joined by lawyer and Congress MP Manish Tiwari who has called UCC unnecessary. So you came out earlier, Mr. Tiwari, saying that this is nothing but an attempt towards appeasement. Why do you say that? But I never said that. Hmm. I said it's a dog whistle. Right. It's an attempt to polarize for the simple reason that uh, there already exists a uniform civil court. If you read the Special Marriages Act 1954 in juxtaposition with the Indian Succession Act, mm. it's a complete uniform civil court. After all, what is a uh, civil court? A civil court is that is religion agnostic. For example, if the Hindus have to get married, they can get married under the, or they usually get married under the Hindu Marriage Act. Yes. If the Sikhs have to get married, they get married under the Anand Marriage Act. If the Muslims have to get married, they get married under the Muslim personal laws. If the Christians have to get married, they get married according to Christian traditions or under the uh, statute which governs their personal law. Yes. However, if you choose not to get married under any of these statutes, you can get married under the Special Marriages Act, like I did. So therefore, that is religion agnostic. So there already exists uh, a uniform civil code. And that's why I'm saying that this is a complete bogey. Right. You're talking about people who can voluntarily choose to get married under the Special Marriage Act. And I get that. But that does not mean that there cannot be any codifying of other personal laws, succession, adoption, divorce, etc., that the UCC will deal with. I ask this because there are many women, particularly Muslim women, who have been fighting for these rights, which they don't get under the Muslim personal law. That's why I'm saying it's a dog whistle. And you, uh, uh, advertently or inad inadvertently, actually name the community at mm. which, unfortunately, this is targeted. The short point is that personal laws or traditions and conventions actually predate the law. And therefore, within those laws also, there is a lot of diversity. For example, the Hindu, uh, the Hindu Marriage Act was codified, mm. right? Now, under the Hindu Marriage Act, there are actually a myriad ways in which you can get married, yes. right? The, the Hindu Marriage Act does not recognize Pinda relationships. That is, if there is a relationship uh, going five degrees on the father's side and three degrees on the mother's side, mm. that uh, marriage is void ab initial. But there is an exception to that. You know, the, the, the marriage between uh, an uncle and a niece or a chacha and his batiji are recognized uh, because there is an exception within the law. Now, for example, if the parliament enacted or legislated the Anand Marriage Act, right? Do, do you think that the Sikh community is going to agree that the Anand Marriage Act should be repealed and it should be replaced by a religious agnostic law? I don't think so. I represent a constituency where the Sikh faith was consecrated. Uh, Guru Gobind Singh Ji Maharaj actually consecrated the Khalsa Panth on the 13th April 1699 in Sri Anandpur Sahib. The, the, the battle mm. to get the Anand Marriage Act enacted was a very, very hard fought battle. Okay. Now, therefore, under those circumstances, do you think that the Sikh community would agree that the Anand Marriage Act be, replay, uh, be repealed and replaced with a, uh, a, a religious agnostic law? I don't think so. So, so under those circumstances, that is why I say this is a bogey, it's a dog whistle. But you're talking about my question, talking about one community. Your answer itself suggests that it will affect all communities. So how is it a dog whistle for one community? And it's not so much about how the marriages are solemnized or which marriages are solemnized. It's also about the rights that flow from a marriage. But as you very rightly pointed out, the Hindu Marriage Act will be affected, Sikhs will be impacted, other communities will be impacted. So why is it that UCC is projected as if it is against one community alone? Well, for, for, for the simple reason that the people who are 
the progenitors of this are essentially uh, going at it with a particular mindset in, in, in mind. Otherwise, you see, when you talk about a uniform civil code, where is the draft of the uniform civil code? As the, uh, there was an earlier law commission which categorically said that given the diversity of India, there is absolutely no need for a uniform civil code, right? There are large number of uh, tribes in this country who actually follow their own customary law, not, not only confined to the Northeast. So after having studied the entire panoply of the diverse uh, customs and uh, practices mm. which are prevalent in the Indian milieu, a law commission concluded that there is absolutely no case for a uniform civil court. So under those circumstances, when you suddenly revive this debate, it's obvious that it is just another attempt to further the agenda of polarization. Okay, I'm guessing your attack is, of course, towards the current government led by the BJP. Now, the BJP says that the fundamental argument for UCC comes from the Constitution itself. It's a directive principle. And Supreme and High Courts also have, over the years, backed a UCC and asked for a UCC. So they say they are only fulfilling that requirement. What's wrong with that? Well, then they don't understand the Constitution of India. The directive principle of uh, principles of state policy mm. are not mandatory. They may be aspirational or they may be uh, declaratory, mm. but they are by no stretch of imagination mandatory. If the uh, makers of the framers of the constitution wanted to make the uniform civil code as mandatory, they would have put it in the section on fundamental rights. They would have made it an article of the constitution of India. After all, the, uh, the Constitution of India was expansive in its vision. You know, the, one of the articles of the Constitution mm -hmm. abolished untouchability, right, which was intrinsic to uh, a, a certain faith. They, they, they abolished Begar, right, uh, which was forced labor. So therefore, if they would have in their wisdom thought that the Uniform Civil Code was essentially or essential for this country, they would have incorporated into the into the constitution. They gave universal adult suffrage at a point in time when 90% of this country was illiterate. So, so therefore, I think to fire the gun from the shoulders of the framers of the constitution is both a misread of the constitution or at much or, or, or much worse, ignorance of the constitution. Okay, fair enough. My question fundamentally is that, you know, there are many personal laws and this isn't just about one community. Many personal laws run foul of the fundamental rights that the Constitution provides to all citizens, most important of them being equality under Indian laws. Don't you think that particularly from the framework of gender equality and gender justice, we do need to do away with discriminatory practices under various personal laws? Well, uh, you ask a very, very complex question to which there is no binary answer. And the reason why I say that is that if you were to read uh, the American press today, the yes. U.S. Supreme Court has come out with a ruling in which they have reinterpreted the entire meaning of equality. For example, they've done away with affirmative action. They have said that affirmative action, which in our country is called reservation, falls foul of the entire doctrine of equality in the U.S. Constitution. So if I were to extend that argument of yours, the equality argument further, then under those circumstances, a lot which has been done under Article 15 and 16 of the Constitution would then fall foul of that right, right to equality. Yes, but people...